It's December 11th, 1928, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Imagine getting away with a scam as audacious as selling the Eiffel Tower, but then getting yourself into hot water because you couldn't quite resist stealing a wadge of cash from some rich dupe. Well, that's the story that unfolded today in history when Victor Lustig, the man who literally wrote the book on being a good con man, committed a theft that was so basic and out of character that it barely deserves mention in his list of really very impressive scams, and yet contributed directly to his downfall. Yeah, this guy had an absolutely amazing career of conning and swindling, convincing all kinds of people to give him money, including Al Capone (laughs) at one point. But this one, on this day, was just a really low blow for him, actually. Mm. Like, he was um, trying to con this businessman, Thomas Keynes, who invited Lustig to his home in Massachusetts, and he just crept upstairs and nicked... 16 grand from his drawer. Yeah. That's it. Like, there, was no, there was nothing sophisticated about the nope. ploy. He um, just he took some money. Ollie, we call this the short con. <laughs> <laughs> you distract them for long enough to go upstairs and just steal a bunch of money from their bedroom and then you run away. Uh, and that's what he did, which launched a kind of a catch me if you can style thing between mm. Lustig and US law enforcement. He now had a Secret Service agent called Peter Rabano, who was kind of the Tom Hanks character of the catch me if you can setup. The full wrath of law enforcement behind him all as a result of this weird impulsive theft okay so let's describe the really cool stuff then because he did loads of things this guy like he gambled with loaded dice he Mm. fixed sporting odds he blacked up and pretended to be an exotic psychic at county fairs what an easy time to be a con man (laughs) (laughs) can you imagine i just black up and put a turban on and people just give me money (laughs) the big sting was a scheme called the romanian box Mm. He had a box, a wooden box, designed to look like it cost a lot of money because it was beautifully varnished and it had little metal twiddly bits on it. But basically, it's just a box. It's just a box. (laughs) And then what he would do is he'd put a $100 bill in one end and then, like, crank the handle and then say to someone, right, we need to go off and wait six hours... And in six hours' time, this box will duplicate exactly the $100 bill that we've just put in. Then he'd take his mark away and get them drunk and then say, ah, it's ready, it's ready. (laughs) And then he'd open the box and inside was a genuine $100 bill that had always been there. But this person drunk by this point would think, well, I've seen the bill go in and now I see two of them. And the clever thing that he'd done is he'd always got $100 bills from his banks in sequence. So he basically tipexed out the number and made it look like it was the same one, but that only involved changing one number on the note. I mean, and you then, say ingenious. This, is the only, this kind of scam it could only be pulled in a society where people are constantly breathing in lead and asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> but the clever thing about it was he'd then take the su- supposedly duplicated note to the bank and then say, look, they're going to cash it, they're going to cash it, they can't tell the difference between my fake ones and the real ones. And that's because it was a real one where he just changed one number and of course they wouldn't notice that. And that was the scam. So then what he'd do is he'd say, right, it's 30 grand, it's yours today, but you can't use it now, obviously, for 12 hours because it's got to rest. And then he'd <laughs> skip town with the money. That does accord with pretty much any tech demonstration I've ever witnessed, which does suggest <laughs> <laughs> that whatever piece of tech you've just seen work is probably not going to work for the next 12 hours. But honestly, we have to talk about the Eiffel Tower scam because that's got to be the big one, right? Purely in terms of its ambition. Yeah, so Lustig is sometimes referred to as the man who sold the Eiffel Tower. And you know what? I've made some I've made some cheap cracks about the gullibility of people in this era, but I have to say that selling the Eiffel Tower isn't quite as stupid as it sounds. Mm. Because if you remember in our episode about the Eiffel Tower, we talked about the fact that it was built as a World's Fair exhibition and it wasn't intended to be permanent. So 1909 it, it was designed to come down, wasn't it? Mm. And it was still standing in 1925, but there were a lot of complaints in the media about how expensive it was to maintain. So it wasn't completely improbable that the government would be looking quietly for a firm capable of dismantling it. Which was the idea. So he, he produced this forgery, what looked like a very official statement saying that Because of all of these engineering faults, we, the French government, are going to have to bring this tower down. And then he had all of these scrap dealers to whom he was then proposing to sell all of this metal, which for them is very valuable. And he invited them all to a conference, basically. It wasn't just one-on-one. Like, they could see in the room 
were all the biggest scrap metal dealers in Paris. Right. They were actually competing <laughs> to give him their money. Yeah, and they'd bid against each other. He didn't actually sell it on the night, but identified the person who was most likely to fall for the scam, and that was a guy called André Poisson. Which is funny, guys. Can I just say language joke? That um, Poisson d'Avril, like April fish in French, is like an April fool. So this guy was like... Oh, that's good. Did you get it? Guys, it's yeah. a language joke. <laughs> I, 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 Do people I, like those? That is the sound of me getting it. <laughs> Do you know what? I think the sound of you getting it is so much sweeter than the sound of laughter. <laughs> but actually, what's clever about it as well, as with the Romanian box, where any bloke who bought the box was hardly going to go to the police because it was dishonest in the first place to try and buy a machine that counterfeits $100 bills. What was clever about choosing Monsieur Poisson was he'd chosen carefully the one with the smallest company mm. that would feel the most insecure and then he got a kickback out of him. Yeah. <laughs> like in, in, the, in the follow-up meeting, he was like, well, you can have it. You've won the contract, but <clears throat> do you want to just add another <clears throat> another few grand for me? Yeah. And he did. So he not only got the money for the dubious scheme that didn't exist, he then got a bribe out of him on top. <laughs> he then made off for Austria with this bribe money in his pocket. And then knowing that it was most likely that Poisson was going to be feeling pretty sheepish about what had just happened to him. He kept an eye on the press to check if there were any reports of this scam having uh, gone down. And when there weren't any, he was like, good, then I know that I can go and do it again. And so he went back to Paris to sell the Eiffel Tower another time. The second time he didn't actually manage to uh, find a buyer. Yeah, at this point he returned to the US where he apparently maybe married a woman called Roberta and they maybe had a child. There's a woman called Betty Jean who claims to be his daughter and she wrote this self-published book that's supposedly about their life as a family which to be fair describes the non-glamorous side of the con man life you know the moving around from place to place you know packing suitcases in the middle of the night yeah. she says the first words he taught her were never talk to the police well i mean but it's, it, the thing the other thing that comes through in this book again not sure of its accuracy but her affection for him and even if this account isn't strictly true lots of people who met him were charmed by him not just as a con man but he was very debonair he was dapper he was well educated you know he spoke six languages mm. curiously his charm is also connected to his downfall because he also had many mistresses one of whom was a woman called billy may and she in 1935 uh, learned that he was betraying her I mean, can you be being betrayed when you're a mistress? But anyway, he was betraying her with one of his fellow counterfeiters' mistresses. <laughs> so there are just <laughs> levels of... You put the mistress in the box. <laughs> yeah. You crack the handle. And then out comes another one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so Billy May decided that she was going to take revenge and placed an anonymous phone call to the federal authorities. And that is actually how they closed in on him. On May the 10th, 1935... Rubano and his team uh, caught up with him on a street corner in New York and he dobbed in all of his buddies <laughs> who were in on the counterfeit claim, claiming that he had nothing to do with it. But they found on him a key to a locker in Times Square where they went and found $51,000 worth of counterfeit bills and the plates wow. with which they had been printed. So they were like, ah, I'm pretty sure you had something to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, you're talking about it like the jig was up the jig wasn't no quite there was up. another it final wasn't. like jig coda <laughs> <laughs> yes which was that he was awaiting trial in new york city supposedly impregnable house of detention he noticed that the routines were getting quite lax in the prison for instance that the prison laundry wasn't tracking the number of sheets taken in and given out so he just kept getting extra sheets he hid them inside his mattress and then he made them into a rope you know a classic sheet rope Basically, then he just cut out a rickety window screen and descended to the street. Apparently, he pretended to be cleaning the windows because obviously <laughs> it's in New York City, so everyone could see him shimmying down on this rope sheet. <laughs> he didn't manage to stay on the run for very long because he was only then out of prison for, in fact, less than a month. And it was the end of the line. He went to Alcatraz and then died in a penitentiary hospital in 1947 without really attracting any attention at all. There's a funny extra bit in his death, which is that it's like a sort of fable come to life. You know, this is classic Boy Who Cried Wolf stuff where he died of pneumonia, that's sad, but it's partly because no one believed him. He'd apparently made what is not an insubstantial number of medical requests, 1,192, 
But everyone just thought that he was faking medical ailments. Well, yeah, but it was the 1,192nd that was the It's always that one that gets you. <laughs> now, this episode first aired last year exclusively to members of Club Retrospectors. Join today and unlock a new episode this Sunday. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. <laughs>